as fans of the beautiful game we all love. We have witnessed some of the greatest moments football has had to offer. All this thanks to a small group of people, the commentators. They are the perfect link between your ears and the memories being made to be stored away, locked in the vortex of your mind forever. In this episode of the TTM podcast, we bring you one of the most famous, celebrated, and highly regarded commentators still actively bringing us those memories we all cherish. You will have heard his voice in the pubs, in the car, pretty much everywhere where a game is on. Think Twice Media is delighted to bring you Peter Drury, where we talk about his life in the gantry and what it takes to be the perfect link between the fans and the game. We also talk about his memories and what it's like to commentate in the Champions League to the World Cup final itself. So sit back, relax, as we bring you Peter Drury, life in the gantry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for tuning into this broadcast this evening. Tonight, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by commentator Peter Drury. Peter, good evening, sir. Hi, James. How are you doing? Very, very well indeed. I'm very happy to have you on to this show with us this evening. I'm very, very honoured, in fact, that uh, you've actually found the time to, to fit us in. So we're very, very thankful for that. Um, I'll immediately hand the floor over to the other James. Hi, Peter. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too, James. Brilliant. Uh, you, you mentioned off air to us that you were at the Liverpool Burnley game last night. So, um, firstly, yeah. initial thoughts on that? Well, uh, ju just another little remarkable story, another lovely little twist, lovely from a neutral perspective, Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a really gripping title race. You know, we've had two or three years of processions, with Liverpool and before then Manchester City. And now we've got a great, great um, contest involving one, two, three, four, five, six, who knows even more teams than that. And Liverpool losing at home for the first time, I think it was in 1,396 days or something crazy. Wow. Uh, just, just plays into that, that narrative. You just don't know what's going to happen next, which is, is fantastic it's... because football is obviously badly missing fans. The narrative... Um, is lent on even more, really, because of that. You know, we're papering over some massive cracks, yeah. and the drama of the football is helping us to do that. Exactly. I was, I was going to, I was going to touch on that, Peter. You're obviously in a very privileged position that you are still able to attend games. How, how is it differing at the moment? Obviously, beyond the obvious, with because there's no fans and no atmosphere. What's the match day experience like for yourself now compared to how it would have been, say, pre-COVID? Yeah, well, the, the sad answer to that, James, is that we're becoming uh, rather accustomed to it. Uh, and I, I hate to have to say that because it's a dilute version of the real thing. There's no escaping that. Um, and when we had just a couple of weeks of a couple of thousand supporters of Premier League games, that was a glorious, glorious thing. But it became, of course, a rather cruel tease because very mm. quickly those supporters went away again. Yeah. Um, and as a commentator... I've said this to a few people, it's a bit like um, suddenly being exposed as a soloist when you've been used to being part of a choir, you know, or, or a band. Yeah, because yeah. there just isn't the background noise. There isn't the wave that you ride upon. There isn't 
the ambience that we just take for granted. And, you know, a goal is not accompanied by tens of thousands of people going bananas, at least not together and jumping up and down in a crowd. And it, it's so very badly missed, we, which is not in any sense to be critical of football, the authorities or certainly the players who, thank goodness, have kept the show on the road somehow. Sometimes you feel a little bit by the skin of its teeth, but it's happening. And um, that's a good thing because people need that entertainment in their lives at the moment. That's right. One, one, one thing that really hit home for me, obviously, I mean, we'd almost become a little bit used to this um, Premier League without fans. When it really hit home to me was uh, third round FA Cup weekend. Yeah. And, you know, the, the likes of Marine, you know, your Crawleys, yeah. Chorleys, you know, and, and they've had to, you know, it's the biggest day in, in, their, in their history. And they've yeah. had to do that without fans and it was so difficult. And that's when it really hit home for me, like, you know, because the FA Cup connects fans of lower league clubs to the, almost to the big time in ways. And, and that was really lost this year. And there were some really great upsets as well this year, which it just went really sort of missed that, fa that fan interaction. No, you're, you're absolutely right, James. They're my favourite games, really, those cup ties involving the smaller clubs the early rounds of the cup, first and second round, but especially, of course, the third round when the big boys come in. Uh, I actually worked at Newport against Brighton. Okay. Um, and, uh, of course, that went to a penalty shootout, and, and in the end, there wasn't a shot, but it, was a, it, was a, it would have been a fantastically bouncy yeah. evening there, and it was, it was a bit curious, really, with, with nobody in the ground at all, and a real shame. Um, and, yeah, of course... But the sad thing is that for these smaller clubs, it might not happen to them again for another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and they miss their wonderful day. And, of course, Marines there against Tottenham was fantastic in its own way. Um, <laughs> it was lovely, but it's such a small ground. People stood in the back garden and watched it. Yeah, but, um, yeah, that's brilliant. It, it, was, um, it wasn't what it would otherwise have been. And um, there's no escaping that. So in terms of your, let's let's flip it back to broadcasting for a moment as well. I mean, we're, we're new to the game. We're, we're now on to the stage of local radio. We, we physically mm. can't get into the studio at the moment due to the, the COVID-19 restrictions. Can you remember when you started in radio in Leeds? Yeah, I, I certainly can. I, I got my big chance um, in local radio in Leeds uh, in the spring of 1990. And I was really fortunate, James, to be there for two or three years um, and learn the trade in what was a fantastic, or on what was a fantastic sporting patch. Um, whilst I was there, Leeds United won the title under Howard yeah. Wilkinson, the last winners of the pre-Premier League. Um, so that was wonderful experience. And I covered Yorkshire cricket. And I, as a soft southerner, I learned a little bit about rugby league. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean... I loved covering Bradford City and Huddersfield Town and Halifax Town, who were in the fourth division back then. Um, That's right. And travelling up and down the land doing those things. Um, and they were great, great days. And, uh, and I remain a, a massive advocate of local radio. And when I'm driving up and down the country listening um, or travelling to football matches, I'm constantly flicking between local radio stations for, for coverage. And, and there are some top, top broadcasters out there doing a great job now obviously um in, in terms of of radio broadcasting as well my, my father's always uh, gave me a great tip which I've, I've actually carried with me since i've uh, flown the nest of the family home and set up station in my own tree i think as far as i'm concerned when the football's on the tv he always told me no disrespect to any commentators on the television set but just sometimes if you turn the commentary down on the television but turn on the radio commentary you can then genuinely appreciate the skill and the attentiveness to detail that the radio broadcasters actually give. Do you do you ever miss doing that on the radio, commentating on a live game? Yeah, I, I really do. I mean, I, I loved my radio years and I was lucky enough to be a sort of found the member of Five Live when it began mm. in the um, early 1990s and, and commentated on football there for a little while. Uh, what I would say to you is that the the two um, jobs, radio commentator and television commentator, are pretty separate, actually. Yeah. Uh, clearly, they have a lot in common, but they have a lot that divides them. Um, and you're right. Um, radio commentary is a, is a skill in its own right and requires descriptive powers, requires um, command of the language, as well as obviously attentiveness to detail and preparation and so on. Um, 
to a certain degree, television commentary requires those things as well, but it requires a more precise reaction to the pictures as they're given you. Yes. So the canvas is a blank canvas for a radio commentator. Yeah. If you're commentating on the radio, you choose what to talk about. If the ball's on the far side and so on, and you're not quite sure what's going on in the football match, you can talk about the full moon or the smell of the burgers or all of those things. Yeah, yeah. On the television, it is a case of reacting to the picture you have. So in that sense, you're more, you're more constricted. You don't have that blank canvas. What I would say is, is undeniable is that the radio commentator is the listener's friend. Uh, the radio commentator is absolutely indispensable. If the radio commentator gets it wrong, it's wrong. There's nowhere else to go. Um, you are the pictures. On the television, yeah. actually, quite often, the commentator is dispensable because we can all darn well see what's happening on our telly. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's and, very and, true. And so, and so you can be, and of course, we all are sometimes, um, an irritant. And people throw a cushion at the telly and say, will you shut up? Well, we don't do that with you, Peter. Um, I can tell you that for a fact, because what you have is a, a very, very clever way with words. I, I, I see it myself when you're like trying to just dis describe something, the way you describe it is captivating. And no doubt people have told you this your whole career. I mean, you've got the man and last moment that we all know it was excellent. But then to try and maybe repeat those things must be quite daunting. Sometimes it must play. It would play in my mind. I think, how on earth am I going to hit that height again? How do you is it? purely reactive yeah well it is yes and the important thing james if i may say is not to try and do it again mm. because these things when they happen and you'll have had moments like this i'm sure where you think i've had a really good day today the words came out in the right order yeah and the thing is to um enjoy that i suppose if people are complimentary but then not to suppose that that's how you have to do it tomorrow yeah. Because tomorrow will bring about another story and another set of circumstances. And you know what? People are very nice about that Madeline's moment, but it was a freak, really. Hmm. And it's lovely that it passed off the way it did. But if, if I tried ever to do something like that again, I would fall flat on my face because it was utterly instinctive. That, that rather bizarre sequence of words came out of my mouth um, and I got away with it. And and. To, to force it would be inauthentic. Well, whether you like that moment or not, it was authentic. It's just what happened to me. My, something sort of took over my soul. Um, and, and if I tried to force it, people would tire of it at once and would, would you know, it, it would just wouldn't be real. So um, insofar as there is a trick, it is, I think, to, to remain reactive, not to try and predict what the story's not going to be, not to try and anticipate how you're going to feel if this that or the other happens just to trust yourself to um deal with a moment when it comes and and occasionally that'll be a special moment but 999 times out of a thousand it won't be you know the ball hits the net it's a goal you do the goal and on you go um and uh that's it really I've, I've got one more uh, quickly before I hand back over to James and then we'll, we'll shoot straight into fact or fiction. Completely understand. You're a very, very busy man. So to get any, any slither of time is an absolute bonus for us. Um, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you've now made the move from local radio. I know you spent a bit of time at the BBC doing my homework, listening to other podcasts, listening to other things that you've done, which I found captivating, actually, as someone we see ourselves as you. 20, 30 years in the past. Uh, so we're at that point right now. Yeah. So um, what was it like for the first time receiving your credentials, a, a big tournament, like a Champions League game or a World Cup final? Surely there's that sense of, oh my God, I've made it. Was it did well, you get that feeling? <laughs> I, I still don't think I've made it. Uh, you, I, don't, I don't think it's a safe- Pro Evolution to... sealed that. Well, well because <laughs> the, the, thing is, the thing is that the moment you think that you're going to fall flat on your face. And, yeah. and we all as broadcasters, I think, live on the seat of our pants um, and we live in a natural state of insecurity, assuming mm. that the next one we do is going to be a catastrophe. And actually, that's what drives us on to do all the homework. Um, yeah, and that's sure. why I've sat in my hotel room in Liverpool all day today, learning Sheffield Wednesday from scratch ahead of a cup tie Everton on Sunday night, because 
you cut the moment you take it for granted you're, you're in a terrible place the first time I, I had half a feeling of having made it actually was while I was still at local radio and I'll tell you um, that I was lucky because as I mentioned you Leeds won the league and they qualified for the European Cup and I got on a plane to follow Leeds in the European Cup in Stuttgart at the start of that campaign in 93, what it was it, two or three, I think. Three, I think, two, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they won it in oh. 91 to 92. Yeah, so 92 it would have been in the September of 92. And believe it or not, at the age of whatever I was then, 24, 25, uh, that was the first time I'd been on an aeroplane, never mind having a European Cup tie. And I did sit there and I looked around me at all the top football writers in the land. I thought, wow, this is little old me. Uh, and that, that, you know, that was very, very, very exciting. Um, and so uh, I've been lucky to be quite often in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and that was certainly Absolutely. one of those times. Yeah. That's, okay, that's, a, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant story that I can just, you know, I can just imagine the feeling. Um, yeah. That must have been some really, must have been summit. Um, yeah. Do you remember what the score was of that game? Yeah, Leeds lost 3-0 away at Stuttgart. Amazing. Eric Cantona had a terrible, terrible game. Um, and they, they brought it back. And in the second leg, Leeds almost caught it up, lost on away goals. But on the Monday morning, it transpired that Stuttgart had broken the overseas player rule. Right. And it went to a replayed third game, which Leeds won in Barcelona which was fantastic for us because it meant they were still in the competition. Yeah. And they played a very, very famous tie against Rangers. Um, which, Nothing wrong uh, with Rangers. Yeah, well, it was a wonderful. And I'll tell you, th this is a great story to rattle on. But no, no. this is a great story. When Leeds played Rangers in 93, um, there was such a risk of crowd trouble yeah. that both sides um, denied the other away supporters they came they shook hands and said listen no away fans it's safer that way and as the young radio leads reporter i went up to glasgow to ibrox to commentate on this game between rangers and leeds and the noise was extraordinary and a couple of minutes in Leeds scored gary McAllister scored a fantastic goal and uh, i went berserk as i should as the leads <laughs> commentator Leeds have scored an eyebrows yeah. and I suddenly realised <laughs> everything else had gone silent and in this crowd of 50 odd thousand Glaswegians I was the only celebratory voice and uh, I suddenly <laughs> I suddenly felt a bit sheepish and gradually and mercifully the, uh, the crowd noise picked up again and uh, Rangers went on to win that tie actually yeah. brilliant brilliant <laughs> brilliant um one thing I was uh, in quite interested in, Peter, obviously you've obviously been around the game for a long time now in, you know, quite close to the inner circles of the game, certainly in the upper echelons. So who do you class as people within the game that, that over the years you've got to know them personally? Who are you really quite close with that we wouldn't expect? Well, do, you know, um, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anybody you wouldn't expect. Most of the people I know are the former pros who've gone into broadcasting. Who I'm yeah, OK, to. yeah. Um, so I don't think you'd be surprised at those. In fact, you know, if you've watched or listened down the years, you'll know who those people are. Yeah. It's become harder and harder down the years to get really close to the people actually within football because certainly the Premier League has become so starry and showbiz mm. and whatever, then there are press officers and so on who keep you separate. And, yeah. and, and, and so those relationships uh, are not necessarily close for that reason. And also because I think it's not a bad thing to keep a point of separation. You know, you, it, it, it's a double-edged sword. If you're, if you're close to someone, that's a useful contact and it's, it's good to have the friendship and to get the feel from within but equally it could it could compromise the way you go about dealing with their club or an event within a game so th there's a balance to be struck there but no most of my close friends in what you would call in football in the circle are those who've gone on to broadcast fantastic and i've got just one more question now and then we'll quickly go into fact or fiction and that'll be that um final question from myself is it's a broadcasting question um for those people that want to get into commentary, do you have any advice into which, you know, what they can do? What, what do people need to do to get into commentary and stay there? 
Yeah, well, it's it, James. It's a it's a competitive world. It's mm. a hugely competitive world. I mean, my first piece of advice would be get lucky, um, which you can't really control. But um, don't be afraid to practice. However embarrassed you feel, looking into a mirror or recording into your phone, have a go at it. See whether you can actually do it. That's yeah. the first thing. And if you think you can do it, keep what you've done, and don't be embarrassed to send it to someone and say, look, I think I can do this. Now, you're not going to be the only person doing that, unfortunately. Lots of people do it. But you, you won't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. So yeah. be prepared to do that. Um, and what I would say is if you get your foot in the door, that is half the battle. Once yeah. somebody is prepared to employ you to do it, you're in. And then you can build from there. And once you're building from there, my, my absolute number one piece of advice would be Remain honest to yourself. Remain authentic. Don't try and be someone else. Don't pretend that you're someone you've seen on the telly or heard on the radio. Do it your way and do it because you love the game and you love the language. You love broadcasting. Do it for you for do it in a way that represents how you genuinely feel. Because the moment you start to pretend, the moment you're inauthentic, um, I think it it finds you out. Yeah. Um, so there you are. Be yourself. That's, you know, all of that can be encapsulated in two words. Be yourself. Be brave enough to be yourself. I think that's wonderful advice. And I think yeah, a lot of listeners that will listen to this um, will really take those comments on board. That's that's class. Very classy. We now move into a critically acclaimed by us a uh, game <laughs> called Fact or Fiction. It's four questions where Peter Jury as the guest will go up against James the other presenter of this show in a game of wit and a game of knowledge to test yourself to see who has the metal to come out on top in fact or fiction. So James, at the moment, you're on a bit of a losing streak at the moment. It may be time to correct it. Are you ready? <laughs> I am. And, and I never thought in my life I would uh, be sat here about to try and avenge a defeat to Marcus Stewart uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a win against Peter Drury. I mean, <laughs> it's almost like I'm living in an alternate universe, but I'm, I'm always ready for fact or fiction. I'm ready to play you into form, James. I hope so. I really do hope so, Peter. Right, <laughs> it's time to go. Peter, are we ready, my friend? Ready. Fantastic. So question number one to Peter first. Cesc Fabregas has more yellow cards than Roy Keane in their Premier League careers. Is that fact or fiction? Ooh. I'll say, I'll say, it feels like a trick question, but I'll say fiction. Okay, great. And James, what do you make of that one? I think that the referees would be a little bit more lenient back then, when certainly in Roy Keane's prime. And Fabregas, I'm going to make a bit of a wild statement and say, probably played more Premier League games than Roy Keane. Mm. Um, and he's a bit of a petulant uh, guy at the best of times. <laughs> And I don't like him. Just throw that in there. <laughs> I'm going to say that is a fact. Okay, so you can actually put a cigarette paper in between the amount of cards that each player has received. Cesc Fabregas has 71 yellow cards in his Premier League career. Roy Keane, 69. So yes, James takes on. a one-nil lead here. <laughs> very, 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 very well tight. Done, James. So the next one is complete and utter left field. The German goalkeeper Manuel Neuer did the voiceover for Frank McKay in the German edition of the film Monsters, Inc. James, is that fact or fiction? He's quite eccentric, Mama Neuer. Um, and he's probably really well thought of in Germany as well. So I think if, if, if anyone was to do it, I, I can believe it was him. Yeah, so I'm going to go fact. Okay. And Peter? Um... I didn't catch the end of James's answer, but it's, it's, that's not a bad thing because it shouldn't affect mine. So I believe it. I, I'm probably a mug, but I'll say fiction. OK. Manuel Neuer did do the voiceover. <laughs> it shocked me to the inner core. I could not believe it, but it's true. So after two questions here... James is leading Peter Drury 2-0, but all is not lost. It is retrievable. It can be salvaged. Yeah. The next one. Peter, this one to you first. Former West Ham player Alvin Martin once scored a very famous hat-trick against Newcastle United. He actually scored his hat-trick against three separate goalkeepers. Is this fact or fiction? It's fact. 
Okay, and James? <laughs> I, d I honestly don't know. So... I'm going to I'm going to say fiction because I'm going to I'm going to play the uh, I'm going to play the game uh, and hope for a, for an extra point. But well, the I, points are not coming your way. It's going Peter's <laughs> way. It's 2-1. He first scored against the Newcastle United goalkeeper, Martin Thomas, in a bit of a crazy game, actually, which Pete no doubt can obviously remember. Um, <laughs> yeah. Centre back Chris Hedworth then headed in goal, broke his collarbone, played on for 15 additional minutes. And then that legend, Peter Beardsley, then went into goal himself. So after those questions, it's 2-1 to James as we head into the all-important fourth question. The term soccer originated in America. Fact or fiction, James? Originated in America. Correct. Wow. Um, it sounds too good to be true. So I'm going to say it's, I'm going to say it's, I'm going to say it's fact. I think you're trying to bluff me here. Okay. Um, Peter, to yourself. Well, I, I don't know, but I'm going to say fiction, um, not least because James was so sporting in the last round when he could have just matched my answer and therefore guaranteed a win. So uh, hats off. Um, so I will take the alternative just because if I'm right and he's wrong, that is an equaliser. And it is an equaliser. It's oh, late in the day. Sorry. It's so late, there's not enough time left in the hour to complete this equaliser, but it's been done. Um, it's, it, it is, it's right, it's, it's fiction. Until the early 1900s, it was, it was used in Britain. It was used and derived from the term association football, at which point in 1970, it was adopted by the Americans. And then there's a stigma which has become attached to it from European football boffins such as ourselves, that we've now said that it's not called soccer, it's called football, which means we have a tiebreaker. So we're going down to the tiebreaker question. Um, who wants to take this question first? James, you decide, because honestly, you, you are the moral winner because you were so sporting during the course of that in what was effectively the semi final. So it's your shout. You can go first or second. I'll go first. Okay, then. So... Giuseppe Bergami played in four World Cups, but did not actually appear in any qualifiers. Is that fact or fiction? Which country did he, uh, did he represent? Italy. Played for Inter Milan. Hmm. It sounds like such a random thing for you to pull out. Um... I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Fact. You might have been like a third choice goalie or something like that. Okay, and Peter. Um, I will say, I find it hard to believe he didn't play any qualifiers. He was a very accomplished player. Uh, so I'm going to say fiction. Okay. We have a result. <laughs> Bergami did not play in any of the qualifiers for the World Cups in Italy, 1982, 86, 1990 and 1998 World Cups. He didn't exert himself in any qualifiers whatsoever. That is obviously a fact, an unbelievable fact. So congratulations to James. He well wins. Done, James. I'm back Funny, on track. Um, <laughs> I've broken the top. Fact or fiction. <laughs> And, and from there, Peter, um, we'd like to say a very, very big thank you for joining us on our broadcast. Um, we value your time so highly, and it, it just goes the mark of a, of a true gentleman to take the time out to, to meet us. And, and we wish you luck, and, and thank you ever so much. And listen, guys, I wish you luck too. It's been a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for thank inviting you. me on, and uh, keep up the great work.